Um, thank you, everyone, um, for joining today in, in person. And um, we've got a lot of people out there virtually online in meeting space. So thanks for joining. Um, I am Christine Nimarala. I work here at GSA Office of Government-Wide Policy. I am one of the, um, the project managers for this um, uh, migration project from the previous legacy system into Salesforce this year. Okay, um, so this is an exciting time for us. We have been, GSA has been collecting travel data government-wide since 2010. We've been doing it for quite a while. Um, we've been doing it pretty successfully in the legacy system for, for all this time. But, um, you know, after, after seven or eight years, it's time for a change, right? Um, technology has advanced, um, systems have advanced, so we here at GSA are going to advance with the time, okay? So um, GSA has spent the last several years successfully migrating and building new applications on the Salesforce platform. This is not the first application um, that's moving on the platform that, you know, that we're working with here. Um, we, we, um, success, we're actually successfully working with a lot of applications here at GSA on Salesforce. Um, so in the Office of Government-Wide Policy, two years ago, we migrated um, the, uh, the system for real property. So I don't know if you guys have um, colleagues in your agencies who work in the real Yeah? Okay. So I don't know if you, you guys have been working with um, colleagues in the real property arena, but they've um, been successfully migrating, um, inputting data for real property for years um, with pretty good success. So um, with Salesforce, um, it's a, a, little, um, a little bit different from the legacy system you've been working with. It's given us um, some more innovative technology and um, access to cloud computing. Um, I don't know if this concept is new to all of you, but we're moving to the cloud. So, um, this Salesforce will operate on the cloud as opposed to um, hosting the data on physical servers, and Salesforce will offer us more collaboration functionality. Okay, so um, with all these advantages, consolidating on one platform will also enable GSA to leverage shared solutions across all of our applications and achieve some economies of scale, which lead to overall uh, reduction in operations and maintenance costs. So hopefully with all these technological and operational um, advantages, this will enable us to better improve the management of your travel data. Okay, so what you're going to expect this year with um, the transition to Salesforce is, um, and you're probably going to see that more through um, Jarl's presentation and demo, is um, similar business requirements. Okay, so we went through the business process in your old, in the previous legacy system, and we duplicated that. You will see that the actual business process and data entry process is very similar. Okay, um, reporting, I, I feel, is um, more advanced and still easily accessible. And a big difference with um, this platform versus the other platform is um, increased technical support. We're going to have a devoted um, help desk for the travel application, which um, didn't exist before, and you're, we're going to talk about that later on in the presentation. Okay, so um, it's a, it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of changes, but a lot of stuff will remain the same, as you're going to see. Um, in order to help with this transition, um, we're going to provide two live training sessions. So we've got, you know, you're here today. We're going to have another one in October after, to help out after the launch, right? Those are two, so they will be provided in person and offer, also offered virtually. We are recording this session, so um, those that aren't able to attend either can still um, access it. And um, in addition to all of that training, we will also have, um, as, you will, as you have already received, user guide, um, a user guide for, um, which offers like a screen by screen. Um, approach to the tool as well as the training presentation, okay, in addition to help desk support. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce um, Jarl Jonas is from Acumen Solutions. Acumen has um, been the organization that helps us migrate from the legacy system. Jarl will be leading the training today. We also have um, more technical support from the development team. Um, there is um, Pranav Desai is also on the line to assist us with more technical questions that um, you may have, which um, if Yarl and I can't provide answers to. And Cheryl um, McLean Barnes is also here for um, more business and policy related questions. Okay, so um, 
Um, for those of you on the line, um, we're definitely um, able to um, handle um, Q&A. If you can um, type those questions in the pod, and we'll try to get to them um, as soon as we can. Okay? Great. Darrell. Thank you, Christine, and I uh, want to welcome everyone here who came to the headquarters at GSA to join us in the room, uh, as well as online. Uh, so as Christine mentioned, my name is Jarl Jonas. It's like Carl, but with a J, pronounced as a Y. Um, it is a Scandinavian descent, but I come from the Norwegian sector of New Jersey. <laughs> uh, but I do live here in D.C. now, and I'm uh, very happy to get to be working with you all today. Uh, I want to go ahead and give you a, a sense of our roadmap. Um, well, before we do that, let me go ahead and make sure I reiterate some of the items that Christine had mentioned. So again, we are recording today's session, so we'll distribute that uh, in approximately two weeks' time once we go through uh, the production process to be able to get a script aligned with that to, uh, from a 508 compliance standpoint. Uh, and then please, again, throughout, we'll be stopping periodically for questions. Uh, but please go ahead, if you're logged in online, go ahead and use the Q&A pod towards the top right-hand side of your screen uh, or the chat box. We have Christine, Cheryl, again, and Pranav to be able to address questions as we go forth. Um, <clears throat> uh, all right, so then let's go ahead and cover the uh, roadmap for today's session. Um, I want to go ahead and first, again, we all understand why we're here. We want to, to learn a little bit about this new system that we're uh, going to be utilizing. And then I'll quickly review the materials that have been sent out and that we have in front of us here in the room. Christine gave us a wonderful overview of the history. But then I want to begin introducing you into some of the user roles that you'll see in the system and that you'll be assigned uh, yourself to your accounts, as well as how the agency hierarchy is set up. We'll review some key business rules that will be driving the use of this system, as Christine had mentioned, uh, some of the laws and mandates that we're working against in order to collect this information. Uh, and then we'll take a look at, um, I, I put together a high-level process diagram to try to pull together in a visual way the business rules that we're working with, as well as how it's then going to end up playing in the system. And hopefully, as Christine mentioned, you'll find this easy. Um, try to simplify it as much as possible. Uh, and, and you'll see as we get in there that Salesforce is quite a robust application. It's definitely a, a trusted application throughout other government agencies as well. Um, so I want to give you kind of your happy path today to be able to get through the, the easiest uh, steps to be able to accomplish your tasks. Okay? But if you do have questions about things that come up, uh, please let me know. We'll start then also talking about how you'll be accessing the application in terms of where you'll be logging in, as well as the ways that you can log in. And then we'll go ahead and I'll jump into the system and, and demonstrate, uh, again, each the data entry, the uh, approval processes, and the final submission of the data to GSA. We'll also then talk a little bit about some other reporting and some other tools that we can leverage along the, along the way, such as a tool that we call Chatter, which is a collaboration tool that we could use perhaps to keep ourselves in check on deadlines or ask questions of each other as we're using the system. I'll, I'll review what Christine mentioned as well in terms of resources that we'll have available to us as come you know, now as well as after launch, uh, including the training sessions. And then again, at any time, please feel free if those of, us, uh, those of you in the room just get my attention if you have a question. Those online, please go ahead and utilize the Q&A pod on the top right. I'll go ahead and stop there and just see if there are any questions at the moment about the agenda itself and if there's anything that you might not see there that you thought we would cover today. If so, go ahead and enter that in. And if we have time, I can see if we can try to address or if it's perhaps embedded in one of our items, we can do that. Okay, so I believe, again, everyone understands the reason why we're here. We have a new training reporting tool, travel reporting tool that we're looking to get acquainted with. Um, and again, Christine gave a wonderful history of, of the use of that and how we've come here today. Now, I know that learning a new system can be a little bit nerve-wracking, whether we've used previous systems or not. We have a variety of experience with us. Um, I typically like to equate learning a new tool like learning how to drive a new car. You know, we, it typically takes a little while for you to get used to where the buttons and tools and, um, you know, some of the new, where the air conditioner is or how you turn on the blinker um, based on the previous car you might have had. But it'll, it'll take a couple of times to get used to it. But once you do, you know, just understand that the whole driving process is familiar to you. And that's what we've tried to do here with the new system. The business rule and the, the submission process, we understand we wanted to keep that as uh, close to what, what was 
and what existed, and then you know, be able to utilize a new system, as Christine mentioned, uh, to be able to centralize that information and use much more robust uh, cloud-based applications. Okay? So just as we go along, if, if you're, again, seeing something that you might not be familiar to, if I'm using a term that you're not necessarily familiar with, please let me know, and we'll just make sure everyone's on the same page. As a Salesforce user myself, I'm also going to try to point out some tips and tricks uh, that we can go ahead and give you and make your, your job hopefully a little easier. Okay? Uh, in terms of the materials, again, so Cheryl had emailed out uh, some, a copy of the user guide as well as the presentation that I'll be using for the beginning of today's uh, training. If, uh, you, if you can have those open, those of us who have joined us remotely, that would be great, or have your own printed versions. We do have those in front of us here today. So on top you see your presentation that I'll be using, and then as we hop into the demonstration you have your user guide. And these are yours to keep. If you have colleagues who may not have joined us today, you're welcome to take the extra copies. Um, and then later on, for those in the room, we'll talk about the evaluation. Okay. So Christine provided a brief overview of the application, but once again we're utilizing a Salesforce application that will be driving the new reporting tool. Um, it is a dedicated, what we call FedRAMP certified hosting platform. Just means that it's a, it complies to the federal com, um, uh, requirements in terms of security, and it is used by a variety of other agencies. Okay, and then what cloud, the cloud-based uh, uh, platform allows us, again, is really to have a much more robust architecture underneath so that we can collect more and more data uh, and, and have the system work faster and be up more frequently and not have any downtime as well as make it more scalable, okay? So as we bring on perhaps more and more bureaus and agencies. I'm not going to go too much further into the history that Christine provided, but just a reference point for you here. Um, this is also within your user guide, so as we get in there, I'll point out at what page uh, you can. Uh, if you want to flip open the user guide now, you're welcome just to see the history there on page five uh, that you can, that you can uh, refer back to. So just want to make sure you get used to that document as we go through as well. And so for today's purpose, we're going to be going through the processes for each of these reporting types. I'll be using the acronyms PCTR for the Premium Class Travel Report, SFTR for the Senior Federal Travel Report, and the TRIP, uh, TRIP for Travel Reporting Information Profile. Now, I understand that some of you may be, again, operating in different roles you'll see that the processes for each of these report types are going to be very similar. It's just different types of data that we would input into the system. Okay, so if you do work with one and not others, I just definitely encourage you to go ahead and be mindful and pay attention to uh, all, all of the processes because, again, it will be good reinforcement for you along the way. Okay, so in, if you are following along in the user guide, um, page 10, Along, you know, similar, it'll have similar information that we see here on the slide in terms of the user roles, okay? So I wanted to make sure that you understood the different types of user roles, and these user roles are entities in the system that provide you permissions to certain areas and tools and data within the system. So again, some of you may be working just with PCTR, and some of you may just be entering the data. Some of you may just be uh, PCTR approvers. So I'm going to go through each of these, but as you'll see, they're pretty similar. Uh, there's a ent data entry and a data approver role for each of the reporting types, and then at the bottom, an oversight role. Okay. In general, the data entry roles are responsible for submitting the related travel data into the system. So when, when we get into the platform, you'll see that you'll have access to the tabs to be able to, uh, to allow us to do that, and we'll be able to enter data, I would, I'm going to call like single, single records, in terms of one record at a time, as well as through a bulk upload process, in case you want to go ahead and upload multiple records through uh, an Excel document that we'll review. Then once those, uh, that data is in the platform, we then would rely on the data approver roles. Those users have access to be able to approve data. I'll, I'll highlight a business change now, uh, as well as later, in the sense that you, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you used to uh, correct uh, approve data individually, each record individually, but now you're going to be approving records in bulk uh, through what we call a reporting period. But I'll come back to that. But just to give you a little a seed, plant a seed in your mind from that business rule change, it's going to hopefully expedite the process as well for you. 
All right, so the approvers go ahead and each of these reporting types. If you do have multiple reporting types um, that you do approve, you'll see as we get in the system as well that you approve these in one area. So it's hopefully more efficient there as well. Question, can an approver also be the data entry? I'm yes. Involved. No, absolutely. So that's a good question. I'll repeat that. Uh, the question was, can an approver also be responsible for data entry? And I can make a note too, uh, which I usually include at the bottom here, but somebody, a user could play multiple roles. So they could be a data entry individual, they could be an approver. Okay, the one role that you probably will not play, which is dedicated for Cheryl right now, uh, and I believe Christine would be the oversight role. So you can consider this somewhat of an administrative role who has oversight of all of the data and can perform all of the functions that I'll be reviewing today, uh, including entry and approval, as well as the final submission into uh, GSA for, uh, to complete the process. One note as well to the data approver role. Um, you'll see that we have uh, next, we'll talk about the level, the hierarchy, but I have a little note there um, that talks about for those who belong to top level agencies, so we have levels at the very highest level. Those individuals will, will be responsible, again, to submit the data to GSA once all of the data has been entered and approved. That will be our final step to complete the process for the fiscal year, the reporting period. Again, I'll review that in a couple of, of upcoming slides, but just a note there as well. So if you are playing both of those roles, too, the approver has the ability to approve data as well as then uh, submit that to GSA for the final uh, to complete the process. Okay, so lots more visuals and, and to come to be able to reiterate that process. Just some highlights there as we go forward. But any questions you have about the roles at the moment before I move forward? Okay. All right, so I mentioned the agency hierarchy then. So as we get into the system, you'll see I'll be logging in as an administrator, um, and I'll see multiple agencies as well as sub-agencies and bureau office levels. For some of you, you most likely only see your agency uh, and below, or you could be that you might be a level two, which you're dedicated to a sub-agency from a top agency. So the levels in the system are set up like this, as we see on the screen, uh, with a top agency level, for example, the Department of State, a sub-agency level then in level two, for instance, a perhaps a field office like Greece, and then the bureau office level, for example, they're Athens. Again, you'll see this as we get into the system, um, but just the important thing to take away from this slide is, is you'll be able to see the information and the data only of your level and below, but not anything above. Okay, and again, the level one users that I talked about will be the ones then from the agency to update their agency status to submit their information and basically indicate that their process is complete. Okay. All right, and Cecilia mentioned earlier too here in the room that we're going to talk about deadlines. So here we are, uh, some key business rules before we get in. So for PCTR, this reporting is done annually, okay, with a closing of the reporting period on December 15th. Okay. Uh, as we, you may have seen by the communications, and, and as I'll reiterate, the, the system will be actually live on October 1st, but will we, be, we will be provisioning users on October 2nd. So we can consider October 2nd when you have access to the system as the beginning then of when you can begin to enter the information. October 1st is a Sunday. Yeah. So come Wednesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're really anxious and you want to get in Sunday. <laughs> we'll talk to Christine about that. I don't know if she wants to come in. <laughs> All right, then for SFTR, okay, this is done semi-annually. So we have two reporting periods, as we'll call them. Um, and again, this is the, the timeline from a business rule standpoint. We're talking about the reporting period as a timeline at which we can enter the information, get it approved, and indicate that our status is complete. So the first one being October 1st through March 31st, then that actually closes. We want to have everything complete by April 30th. The second one, April 1st then to September 30th, closes on October 30th. And then lastly, for TRIP, again, this is also done annually, and that reporting period closes on November 30th. Okay, and typically there is only one entry uh, for TRIP, since that's more of a summary report. 
Any questions on those key business rules? Okay. And um, these are also reiterated in your uh, user guide. Um, I think it's on page six, but I'd have to find myself in case you want to go back. Or maybe page four. Six. Oh, just six. Okay. I remembered correctly. Page six on the user guide for the business rules that I just reviewed. I did want to note um, these diagrams are something that I built particularly for today's presentation, again, to try to pull information that we've been talking about now and before we get into the system to help give you a visual map. Okay, so I've used, and I'll just scroll forward and I'll show you that I have one for each, and you can see they're very similar. So I'll review one and then just kind of point out the differences of the other two. All right, so we just talked about for PCTR, the, the reporting period, the time period by which we want to have the information input into the system, reviewed and approved, and then submitted to GSA to be considered complete. Okay, so that'll begin October 1st for us, October 2nd after accounts are provisioned, but there, thereafter, depending on where that day falls, um, you know, that will remain most likely the same. And then the reporting period closes December 15th. I have a little lock here to remind us that the system will go ahead and uh, be locked down at that point so that no further information can be input into the system. If you want to make a note for extenuating circumstances, uh, we will go ahead and contact support if we needed to go ahead and have information either updated or input after that date. So I'll review how to get a hold of support later on today. All right, and then we talked about our user roles, right? So we see our, our oversight user here can basically have access to all of the information and all of the processes and functions. All right, but I'll start here on the left. So right, our data entry users are going to be the ones to enter the data. There's two types of data, particularly for PCTR, including standard and protected. Protected would be something that's more, um, more for a private mission. Okay, and as we get into the system, you'll see that there will be certain fields that won't be filled out just to protect information uh, and keep that private. Okay, so we'll review that. So your big first step in that is to enter the information of either type. And as you can see, I put a little note here too that we can do this individually per record or I can upload an Excel file uh, in a bulk process in case we have multiple records we want to submit. All right, and sub, some sub-steps of that is to then, as we get into the system, I want to start queuing your brains. We want to update the organizational status. So each of us at our level, when we, think, when we think we're complete with entering all of the data for that particular reporting period, I'll show you how to update the reporting period in the system to be considered complete. And then the data entry submits the report for, uh, reporting period for approval. Okay. So then we come to step two. And again, if it could be different users. It could be the same. We'll assign this to an individual to go ahead and approve. If that's ourself, that's who we'll assign it to. And then the approver user reviews and approves the information. Again, this is going to be in bulk. We'll, re we'll approve what's called a reporting period, which will be a group of records. And then uh, but you'll, you will have the ability to peek into each of those records, again, just to make sure the information is correct, but you'll approve the whole group of records at once. We do have the ability to reject in case things are not correct, hopefully soon before the, you know, well before the deadline so they can be updated. And we can also reassign. If for some reason we feel we may have received this in error or somebody else needs to approve, we can send that record on to somebody else. And then our last step in the process, again, is the level one user, as I talked about, is going to submit to uh, submit the data to GSA. And here, it's basically updating a status in the system which will indicate to Cheryl, as she looks at her view, that that agency is considered complete for the fiscal year. So she has some indicators which I'll show you to be able to look for, as well as yourself, just to make sure, um, you know, each of your levels that we're completing each of these steps and sub-steps. So this will also be sort of how I demonstrate the system today, uh, but I'll step through the other report types as well just before we begin. So again, with SFTR, October 1st to April 30th is our 
reporting period, the time period at which we have to enter the information, but you can see the steps exactly the same, except the data is just a little bit different. For SFTR, we have standard and executive travel data. One, sorry, that, that's one long, one long title <laughs> of the standard federal executive travel data. Okay, instead of two types. But we enter it, update the organizational status, submit for approval, get that approved by the approver. Approver can reject or reassign if need be, and then level one goes ahead and indicates that this process is complete. And then lastly for TRIP, again, very similar, just different time periods, pardon me, by which we can enter the information and the different type of information that we need to put into the Any questions about sort of the visual map? I usually try to give people a, a way to, to visualize what we're going to do in the system before we hop in. Cecilia. So when we're going through the different um, levels, we're going to get an email to let the next person or the next level know that the product is ready for review and we have to keep going in. That's a good question. So the question, just to make sure everyone heard, is as we go through these steps, uh, will the system be notifying um, the individuals of the, the status of, of what's, what needs to occur. So in each of these occurrences, so once, the, once you input information and you submit for approval, then the approver will get a notification by email um, and also a link to be able to go into the system uh, directly to approve that record. Um, as well as uh, once the, once, uh, the, the, the reporting period is approved, just to make sure I'm using the right terms, then the person submitting will also get a notification that that has been approved, or in the case that it's been rejected or reassigned, they will be notified as well. Sure. And then just let me um, finish that. The only item that is not necessarily going to trigger a response is number three, um, but that will be where Cheryl goes into the system and kind of can see, she can either generate a report or see through the icons that we'll see shortly um, where people stand in their process. My last question, I promise to write now. Sure. Um, the okay. hierarchy, when they're going in, say the bureau is putting something in before it goes to the sub-agency, will they, will we know ahead of time, like for instance, I'm at the headquarters, and that one of my bureaus is putting in information, and then they have field units that are putting in information, will there be notifications, or we're going in there to check? Uh, there will be notifications, um, and I want to make a make sure that I'm going back to the level slide here, just where the question was. And um, each of these levels also will be reporting on information individually, so it, there may not necessarily it's a hierarchy, just how the system has been set up. But there are also lanes of sorts um, that they'll each have their own independent in the system, what we call a reporting period to put information into and group that. If the approver happens to be in a level two or above, um, you know, then th yes, that, that person or th those individuals would be notified, as I mentioned, within the, the previous steps. Does that help answer your question? I just wanted to make sure it's going to be an email. That yeah. Works. Yeah, each of, each of the steps, of particularly the data submission, the you know, ready for approval and the approval or rejection and reassignment, um, the only one isn't is the step three for the level one to trigger an email to, to Cheryl. But you know, she'll be able to go in and pull, pull reports and, and look at icons. All right. So let's start talking about enough about process and about how to get in. Um, just want to briefly review with you the new URL in terms of where you're going to be going to access the platform, which is travel.reporting.gov. If you are following along in the user guide, we can go ahead and turn to page 11, which starts to cover the entry information, or make that page 12. Um, and the, the biggest thing I wanted to point out on here, you know, it is a, a new home page, and it has a couple of different sections to be mindful of. The top section here is just more of an about area to allow us to see the system purpose, kind of the functions. The contact information here will be very important. These are your help desk emails for each of the reporting types. 
So I'll, be, I'll review these later on, but they also are right on your login page. Um, and then the resource links, this will continue to build as, as the travel team and group decide what helpful documents will need to be placed there for you all. But you'll see there's similar types of repositories in the system as well. All right, then in order to log in, there's three different ways to log in. So let me zoom in um, a little bit with those functions. So on the top, there was an, uh, the ability to log in with OMD Max. Uh, for those of you who may or may not have obtained those credentials, if you need more information, in the electronic version of the guide, there is a link to be able to obtain uh, by step to obtain OMB Max credentials. This is, in essence, a way for you to utilize a single sign-on uh, authentication method versus having to do um, the username and password and getting emailed a code, which we'll review shortly. All right, then the next will be the travel reporting tool username and password. So this is actually what will be mailed to you initially uh, on October 2nd, and you'll come in with a link to reset your password. Okay, typically, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the email address associated with their account. Okay, so on October 2nd, again, you'll get an email with a link to follow, and then you can set up your username and password. Once you do log in initially to the system, you can then utilize one of the other two methods subsequently. Okay, but you have to authenticate your, um, and activate your account first. And then the last option would be using, the for GSA staff only, the GSA single sign-on credentials. Okay, just for today's purpose, so um, you'll see that, that the system will require, oh, go ahead. The um, passwords will be emailed October 2nd or 3rd? Uh, the, the morning of October 2nd, you'll get an email with your account, okay. and it'll be a, a, your username. That should be more... Um, Is there a time frame, thing? like how sometimes links have like a 24, 72 hour period, because that's a Sunday. I'm just wondering. Yeah, well, that's why we were waiting until Monday morning. Okay. Yeah, Monday morning. October 2nd is a okay. Monday. Oh. Okay. And they have extended the time period by which that link will expire. Okay. I don't know the exact time frame, but maybe Pranav can help look that up for us. Okay. Pranav might know. Um, I think they've extended that knowing that people won't sometimes immediately go in, but um, beyond 24 hours, I know for sure. And then what you'll do is follow that link, and then you'll reset to a password that you want. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, <clears throat> this is Bernoff. Um Jarl, I think they uh, they set that to 48 hours. 48, okay. Good to know. We'll make sure we, we send that out to any reminder, reminder communication. All right. So to get in, um, if you use the travel reporting tool, login and password, you're going to enter your username and password. And it does have a two-factor authentication uh, requirement. So what will happen is you'll be presented with a screen like this and be emailed a code to the email address associated with your account, typically your work government address. And then you'll enter in the uh, code in the box and then click the Next button here in order to get in. And then once you do, you'll be into the system, and you'll see a screen similar to this. And this is where I'll um, stop here and begin to, to start the demonstration. But I want to make sure that everyone's familiar with the login process, and if they have any questions, we can review now. Okay. And you can see, uh, as we move into the platform, I'll be look, uh, moving to page 13 of the user guide through 16, if you're following along there. So hopefully it's getting you a little bit familiar with that resource. So if no questions at the time for us to review. I'm going to go ahead and first give you uh, an overview, so those of you who are newer to Salesforce, to give to how to navigate the system, some tips and tricks of how to get around. We're then going to go through the entering uh, of the data of each of the report types. I'll save some time. I have some canned examples to use. I'll enter in some PCTR data and then go ahead and just show you. Some other examples of the other types, but also how you can update and edit records uh, in case you haven't submitted them yet for approval. We'll go through the upload bulk 
data process. And then we'll put on the approver hat, take a look at what it means to approve records. And also, it, from the level one approver, looking at how we update the agency status to indicate to Cheryl that everything should be uh, complete. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and take a look at the reports area. There are some reports that were in the former platform that we've brought over and tried to help replicate. So those are available to you. We're going to keep the reporting training somewhat light today because it is definitely a robust area of the platform. Show you how to locate the existing reports and download those if you want to keep an offline version. But subsequently, we'll most likely be holding some deeper reporting uh, sessions uh, later in the fall. Okay. And then for those who may not be familiar, we'll talk about working with Chatter, again, a collaboration tool in the system um, to be able to help you connect with those working in a similar capacity. So give me one moment. Switch over. Okay, now I have, this is a development environment. Um, I'm going to be using uh, what we call a training sandbox, so I'm not logging into the live environment, but I did uh, just want to let you know. Um, so I, I do also have a role that I'll be using to help me play multiple of the multiple user roles. So as I go through the system, again, depending on your role, you may not see everything that I'm seeing today. But I did want to flip here to our development environment just to show you the login page as it would be seen in the browser. Okay, you saw the screenshot, and it pretty much will be the same here. I did want to point out something I didn't in the presentation, that you do have a forgot your password link. This will be something that once you at least access the system once, that you can utilize to reset your password in case you forget. Okay, you can also contact support who will help reset and send you a link similar to what you'll receive on the first day uh, on October 2nd. And then inside the platform, I'll show you also in the case that you want to change it, just to be secure yourselves where to go to do that. All right, but just for time's sake, I'm going to, I'm already logged in. And again, I'm, I'm logged in as a, um, what a, an, oversight user, an oversight user, similar to a role that Cheryl would have. Um, so you can see here, and if you're not sure exactly of your role, up here in the top left corner we have the user access, and it reminds us of the role of the, you know, associated to our account that we're logged in as. Before I move down to the left, let me just go ahead and talk a little bit about these navigational elements here at the top. So these are typically what we refer to as tabs. You can see it has somewhat of a tab structure on when, when it's clicked. So each time you'll land on the travel home tab. And if you do want more information about each of these areas, these links go to uh, the GSA website that describes each of these uh, reporting requirements in more detail. Okay. So that, that'll open up a, a new tab or a new window. All right, but as I move along, you'll see as we'll review each of these tools. Right. Looks like I might have timed out, so give me one moment. That's what I get for logging in too early. And that's a good reminder, um, and I think yep, Renan, you can remind um, me about the minutes. session um, length I that think we have. Previously, I think previously, 60 to 90 um, minutes. In the INL application, I think you guys had uh, 15 minutes. Um, in Salesforce, it'll be 60. So a bit more time at least to leave our desk if we need and take a break. Uh, I obviously left that go too long, so apologize for that. All right, so give me one more second then to switch over my view. Doing some administrative magic at the moment. Okay, so back in action. All right, so as I come home, again, landing on the Travel Home tab, if I move over to the right here, again, each of these are tabs. You can somewhat consider this if you're used to the browser function of having different tabs. This is considered, you know, sub-tabs within the application itself. Chatter, again, we'll review shortly, but our collaboration tool. Approvals, if we're an approval user, we'll have 
uh, access to be able to review what's waiting for them to be approved. The bulk upload, okay, so you can see that and we'll review this as the approval user as I go through the process. Bulk upload process if we are data entry users where we would upload our spreadsheets that we'll review as well. And then our data entry tab which we'll spend quite a bit of time on how we access entering individual records as well as updating our organizational status and submitting for approval and then reports. Okay. What I would want to uh, suggest and highly encourage is that you use these tabs as your main navigation. Try to avoid using the back button of your browser that can sometimes uh, confuse the application or confuse you. So use, if you're ever feeling lost, just come back to the travel home tab and then use, use these main navigational elements. For the most part on the left hand side, these are going to be uh, the sidebars, sometimes it's called, again, the first box here tells you the user role in which you're signed in. If you have multiple roles, you'll see multiple roles listed there as well. If we have the approval role, then this will be an additional way to access that approval site, okay, that approval area. So these are same, different access points to the same area. Okay, but one difference is you'll see that it opens up a new window for us. Reminders of the contact, who, and who to contact for the help desk in case you are running into any issues or would have questions. And then again, these boxes are going to be more informational in terms of any upcoming events, perhaps as we're uh, in the real system when we launch, reminders about different trainings going on, as well as perhaps the recorded trainings, links to the user manual, uh, and then a document library for right now, the travel regulation document as an example. So just trying to put everything at your fingertips in order to, uh, when you're in the system, that you would need access to when you're trying to complete these tasks. One last item here that I want to point your attention to is the search. This will be a little bit more important as we go through the process, but just if, in case you want to find something, this will search the entire system for you. As we get into the system, you'll see that there will be a unique ID for the reporting period for which we are entering data. Um, I have a lot here that I've been entering in from a practice standpoint, but you'll see the system will remember where you've been. So in case, you know, you'll start to get a feel of how you can skip through and, and hop through a couple of different steps or get access to areas without having to navigate through. But so I can go directly to this reporting period but I want to make sure you understand where that is first, but I wanted to show you the this, this search here. Um, and then it also will do wildcard searches. So if you're not exactly sure of the exact number, the, the asterisk here means it'll search for everything starting with RP and bring you back a list that you can look for. I'm going to point this out because I, as we go through and you find your reporting period, I'm going to recommend that you come back and search for it so that it's in your recent items. Uh, and that way, again, you can click up here and just hop right through instead of having to go through a couple clicks that I'll show you. But either way, it's going to be totally fine. Okay? So just be mindful of that up there. And then in case, uh, you know, when you want to log out, you want to go ahead and come up. I have, uh, this would be your actual real name. As you enter the system, we have sample user data here. So as to log out of the platform, just from a secure standpoint, closing your browser will be okay, but log out would be be better as well, particularly from a secure standpoint, if you're used, particularly if you're using a shared workstation or anything like that. All right, any questions about the overall navigation of the Home tab and the areas available to us on these? Okay, all right. So what we're going to start with, is, if we remember our diagram, we're going to start with the data entry step. Okay, and I'm going to start with the uh, individual record completion. Okay, and so for those of us who are following along on the, uh, I almost said travel guide, <laughs> the user guide, uh, we can look at pages uh, starting on 19 in order to follow along in terms of where I'm going. So when I come to the data entry tab, 
Okay, again, these are going to be the data and those of us with data entry user roles. If we're playing both parts, um, that's okay. So this will be one of the ways that you can come and enter, begin entering the information. A couple of things I want to point out on this page. This is, seems like a lengthy paragraph, but it reiterates a lot of what we'll be going over. If you don't remember, if you don't have your user guide with you, it's a good place to come back and just point out a couple of things that are happening on the page that I'll review with you now. Okay, but you can see that the application, it's going to be important for us to indicate which application we want to work with. I'm going to start with PCTR and then move on to the others, but you would just select the different uh, radio box, as it's called, in order to change the system and indicate which application we want to work with. Okay, you can see that it refreshes. Right. I also want to add, so um, Yarl is signed in as an oversight user, with a especially Carol, with access to all of them. So for yep. those of you that don't um, have the rights or actually don't submit data for all of them, you'll only get up the live radio but for what, you're, what you have access for. Okay, so Good point. if you do PCTR, you'll only see PCTR. If you do all three, you'll see all three. Okay, so you don't have to choose if you only do one. Thanks, Christine. Sure. So do you know which one we do? Yes. So for um, the, the permission sets and your user roles, we've duplicated what was in the legacy system. Okay. So whatever you were before, what you're going to be, oh, what you're going to have again. <laughs> okay. well, so. Yeah, that, that's a, a good point of clarification. Just make sure everyone on the line heard. Um, the question was, you know, do we have to perform all of these? And again, we've replicated the permission sets that were on the legacy platform in the new one. So if you've only did PCTR in the past, you'll only see that option. But if you do have access to one or more, you know, more than one, then you'd be able to switch through the application. Okay. Yes. And we have another question here in the room. I was just um, asking her if she had access today because she's new. So what if somebody is new to this role and doesn't okay. currently have access, how do they get it? Show, show, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think, yeah, we've looked at all the users and if, you're, if you weren't in the old system, then you would be assigned whatever role like Cheryl would have let you know. Right. For, so if you currently, for example, if you were currently a PCTR user and this year you have to submit SFTR data, you would be an SFTR new user. So you would submit um, a request for the help desk and they'll create your account for you. So in the case, and then, and yeah. then they'll figure, and then they will, during that account creation, they'll pull you up and they'll see that you're a multiple user and then they'll magically create, you know, the, the buttons for you. But um, yeah, so it, right now each user is individual, you know what I mean? So if you don't have access to one, then that's um, a help desk ticket, just process wise. So the help desk will create all new user accounts? Yes. That's a new, yes, so that's a new process. Okay. So just uh, yeah, before we go on to the next question, um, yeah. there was a comment about a question, will, will the help desk create all new user accounts? And yes, that's a new process as well that has been delegated to the, the support and help desk team. So as we review later who, where, who to contact, we'll remind you of that as well. So how will the help desk know if that person is actually authorized to act for that? So the question is how will then the, the support team know if that person is authorized so there is uh, an approval process within that particular circumstance that Cheryl would then be notified and she'd need to go through uh, and approve that new user. Um, so it does go up to her for those kinds of instances as well as for other type of support tickets that either may not be an issue or I, I wish the system did this or you know if it, different things that we'll, Cheryl will have to go ahead and approve in the process. And the reason why I'm asking is because now we're allowing it to go down as far as to the field, so someone in the field could be asking to yeah. actually be able to have access, yeah. but that's not what um, leadership may want. Yeah, and she will most likely, Cheryl would double check then with the corresponding agency or bureau as well with her, her approval process. We'll make sure when she gets back that I'm telling the truth there. <laughs> yeah, so, so for the new user and for the, the help desk, it's definitely a more formalized process. There's a tracker, you know, and so, you know, it is in the system. And it's actually, um, we've noticed when we did all the data analysis, it actually helps more consistency mm -hmm. in um, account creation. You'd be surprised about yeah. how many uh, different abbreviations or spellings of agency, you know what I mean? So it really kind of clogs up the system. So when it's, you know, when it's in a centralized 
process like that, you know what I mean, then um, it actually helps for cleaner reporting in the future. Okay. So yeah, there is a process, there is an approval process that she does have all of the, the agency approver information, so she'll probably go through that and then she gets Okay, because I know we need to do this in Right. It'll get to her eventually. You know what I mean? It, it will still get to her, but the, but the actual account creation and the process, the help desk will, will do that. Good. Any other questions? That's different, so I just want to yeah. clarify that's different than the previous process. Yeah, because it's nice to create a little We've taken some off your plate. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so then again, just uh, be mindful to choose the application that you're working with as well as the fiscal year. So as I step through each of these as well, so we know that PCTR and TRIP are annual, so we'll see fiscal years listed. You will only be able to uh, input and or edit data that has not yet been approved for the current fiscal year. Only previous fiscal years will be viewable. Okay? Exactly. So you can only operate or you know, edit input information for or edit information on the current fiscal year. Previous fiscal years you can only read or review information. Okay. And you can't you can't enter it. As I mentioned before, the, the, the fiscal year is locked, or the, the reporting period is locked in the system come the deadline. So you won't be able to operate. You'll only be able to look at information, not edit or add or delete. Something we're moving to, uh, you know, just constantly, you know, will the the older information be migrated over so we can still see it? Yeah, good question. So question from Cecilia, will the information from the former system be migrated over and that is actually occurring now um, or maybe even has occurred? So uh, yeah, and remind me how many years passed. All year. Okay. I don't know. I don't know the exact count, but all years. Okay. So all, all data from the previous platform will be migrated over. So then to review that information, that you'll, you'll can go back here through the fiscal year list. For reporting, yeah, all year. All available. Okay. Um, just before I scroll down too, you'll see that the system also tracks here. Um, when you begin to know the reporting periods and the TD is a, a travel data for an individual record, as you scroll over certain links in Salesforce, you'll start to see some related information. You have ways to hop into, okay? But I'll come back to this just so you understand what this unique ID really is looking or is standing for. Uh, but just Keep in mind that this would be an additional navigational uh, technique for you to hop into once you become familiar with these numbers. For the most part, I think you'll be using the areas down here. Again, this is a test system, so data may not be truly um, as real as it may in, be in the real world, but I just wanted to point out, for those of us who may have access um, to one agency or more, I can use the expand or contract. These will go ahead and just to show you the tree view on some of these uh, agencies. Okay, we have some, some have uh, just one, and then some have multiple ones that we can further expand down to level three. So when I mentioned the levels earlier, here you see Department of Defense is gonna represent our level one agency. The sub-agencies here at level two indented a little bit. And then when I expand this area on their operational support, the US Army Priority Air Support, Air Transport shows up. So this will be level three. Okay, and as I mentioned, each of these then, um, the level one agency, level two and level three will have their own reporting period and ways of entering in data. The approval process will be by individual, so if they happen to cross levels, you know, that, that is happening, you know, perhaps in the background, but it doesn't necessarily roll up here in your tree view from an approval standpoint. Okay, so I just want to make sure that you understood how the levels are operating. Um, and I'll come show you then kind of what these icons and colors mean. So let me go ahead and start with the Department of Agriculture. And I'm going to start actually from the outside in. Okay, this is an icon of a form. As I scroll over, it says data entry. Okay, so data entry is going to be the icon that I click in order to start inputting an individual record here for PCTR. Okay, if I'm the data entry individual for this level, the Department of Agricultural Level 1. All right? What was that to pay it? Yeah, I, it's a little memo icon or, yeah, a little pad icon or a form perhaps with a pencil, however you want to describe that. But if you scroll over, you see that it's data entry. 
When I move over to the left, I see incomplete reporting period. Now, for those of us who enter in TCTR data, we know that we would enter in more than one record within the reporting period. So you can consider this reporting period then the group of individual records within the system for that reporting period. And for PCTR, again, that was October 1st through December 15th at this level. Okay? So everything relates here. You can kind of consider this a swim lane of sorts or just a lane, but everything in this row relates to this level of, of uh, the agency or the sub-agency or the bureau. Only the level one agencies will then have this house icon, and this is going to be available to approver users only. I'll come back to this as we get through the approvals, but the approval, this will be then where the level one user, as I described earlier, flips a switch and indicates that their agency is considered complete. Okay, that can't happen unless I see all icons of the reporting period green, which means that all data has been submitted and approved for that. Okay? So for those of us with just one or two, not too bad. You know, this is, again, something that Cheryl might look at, and as I indicated earlier, she'll be starting to look at all of these icons, whether they're green or still gray. So gray would be incomplete, green would be complete. If we're at Department of State, a larger organization, you know, we can take the level one, can start to look at, okay, who's left over in my um, agency that has to go ahead and submit? Of course, being a test system, we have a lot of incompletes, but this is an, a visual indicator for us to be able to look at, depending if, if some of us are at level one. And again, when all of the reporting periods are green, I then, as the Department of State level one, can indicate that everything is complete for that year, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit, but then Cheryl knows, okay, everything's done for that agency. Go ahead. Is there a feature to also hide the completed, um, the completed, the filter, right, the filter out the ones that are completed? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. So the question, is there a way currently in the tree view to perhaps filter out or hide the completed ones? And at present, there is not, but it's not a bad idea. Um, we can definitely parking lot that as potential uh, future enhancement. Well, Carl has um, oversight but, view, so it's, it's yeah. just a lot because he has access to everyone, so your state, right? So, yeah. so it's easier to see yeah. this. Right, right. Yeah. <coughs> this is a little now, but yours should be a lot cleaner because he has access to yeah. at all. These are all Let's see. If I scroll down, I'm not making people just think. Yeah. It's, it's still pretty long. But. <laughs> Carl, did you say what the wrong one was? Not yet, but good question. I'm glad I planted you in the audience for today. <laughs> uh, so yeah, somebody asked, um, and I wrote down your names earlier, I wanted to call you by name. Jeanette asked if, uh, what the red icon meant, and you can see again, we have gray and white, which is incomplete, green being complete, and red is rejected. Okay, so you remember earlier I mentioned that re reporting periods could be rejected. Perhaps there is a missing or incorrect uh, entry uh, we need more information, so that would be indica indica in indicative of something being sent back to the uh, person who sent it for approval. So good question there. All right. Um, so well, the process that I'm going to show you now is to go ahead as uh, an individual data entry user. I'm going to show you how to entry enter uh, one data record. Then we'll go through and take a look at the reporting period. I'm going to use uh, Department of Commerce to do that here at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office level. We'll enter in one entry. You'll see there's a sample one there already. We'll come to the reporting period. Remember our sub-step in, in step one of the data entry, update the organizational status, and then submit that for approval. And then we'll come back and look at the, um, how the level one agency then, as an approver, and approve that information as well as update the agency status. All right, so for now, without knowing all of the IDs that I mentioned earlier, just look for this data entry icon. Make sure you're at the right level. Okay, and now we're at the data, data entry page. So just to show you, um, I'm going to start just here at the bottom first. Each of the uh, data entry Records, and, the, and it's called travel data, so each record is called new travel data. 
So the group of travel data records is assigned to this reporting period ID. So this is a system generated reporting period ID. Okay, and that was the RP that I typed in search earlier and that also you see here on the left. So this is our group of records. We're only entering in now one, but I'll show you how to get to the reporting period page to see the group of records. Wait a minute, you took that number that's highlighted from the left. I did not. So this is, once I clicked on um, the data entry tab, it, the system knows that I'm trying to associate this new travel data record with this reporting period. So this reporting period ID is unique to the, uh, the level as well as to the fiscal year. And so since we're in PCTR, it's the annual fiscal year and then the, the bureau or sub-agency or, or level one agency that I'm entering information for. Does that help answer your question? Okay, yeah, so this is system generated. I didn't input this myself. Um, and, it, you know, I, I recommend not trying to change this because you'll get errors. So just for today's purpose, I'll go ahead and enter in some information that's required here. As I'm entering in information, be, be mindful of the fields here. The red bar to the left are required fields. Okay. And in case I don't know exactly what a field may represent or to put in, I have these question mark bubbles or icons that I can roll over and you get a larger explanation here of what should go in that, ta uh, that field. Okay, so I don't need to enter a middle name, but um, yeah, we'll keep it pretty generic for today. So just a note about the date. It cannot be outside the reporting period time frame, for instance, in the future, or definitely within, you know, before the, the reporting period began. So it has to be within that. You'll see, you know, the farthest we can go is, is today or somewhere in the past. Now, agency trip ID could be uh, an agency or bureau defined unique ID. I believe this, this may have been used in the previous platform. Um, so if you wanted to, to still utilize that, the field was provided for you, but you can see it's not required. Um, I will get a system generated unique ID for this particular entry, uh, and I'll show you where to find that as well. Okay, we have our exception codes that were brought over. So this is a selection as well as our purpose codes. And I'll select it as a mission. And just enter in whole numbers here. It will, the system will convert it to currency, American currency. Now we have the option of save or save and new. Okay, pretty hopefully self-apparent uh, there. Save and new, if I have another record to enter, I could keep going through this process of entering in, in, the, in the fields here and I'll just be brought to another field. For today's purpose, to save time, I'll just go ahead and click save. And here is my net new record that I've entered into the system. In the case that I see something, I want to do a double check. If I need to go back and edit, you can see the edit button here. Okay, so I just need to scroll down a little bit. I can come back to the form and perhaps I mistyped one of the values so I can come in and save that again. All right. Now I mentioned that the, this entry would have a unique ID, so that's what this number represents as well. So this is an individual travel data record okay, that is associated with this particular reporting period. Again, the reporting period being a group of travel data records unique to each level and unique to each reporting, the, the time period, the, you know, fiscal year. If you had entered um, an agency trip ID, will the system still give it a unique identifier? Yes. Yeah, so the question was, if I did enter an agency trip ID, would the system still assign a unique ID? And um, yes, it, it'll still assign it. Um, 
just again from a consistency standpoint, just so there's no overlap uh, from all the users entering in a unique ID. And that from a reporting purpose that it can be also found. So I mentioned earlier, like, so you can start to recognize if, if you're at a particular level and you're with PCTR and you want to just keep entering information or you know you're going to come back, you can go ahead and remember 4325. And you won't have probably as many in your recent items that you saw here or here. But that's, as I mentioned earlier, you can even search on 4325 to come back. But let me show you a couple of ways. Okay, so again, I can keep entering in this information, but I'm going to step back and just review shortly. I came into the data entry tab as a data entry user. Okay, I was in the Department of Commerce. And I went ahead and selected the data entry icon. So that would be if I wanted to enter more and more information. Now this is the reporting period icon. So this is that RP unique ID is representing this group of travel data. Okay. So here's the one um, that I just entered with a 2500. So that is my most recent entry. So you can see you know, that just a different way to get around and trying to get you familiar with uh, the terminology from entering in the data to the group of records here on the reporting period. Now, if I did have a, protect, a protected travel data to enter, this is where I would need to come to enter one of those types of records. Okay, I could enter a standard here as well. Okay, so you can see there's multiple entry points for us to go. So that just to come to the protected travel data page so you can see how that differs. All we're going to need to be entering in is our exception code and purpose code and the cost. and the number of travel legs, okay? Save and new as well, or save and, and cancel. We'd go ahead and cancel the process altogether. So this is going to take me to that travel data page, that unique record page. If I want to step back to that group page, the reporting period page, I can now use this link. Okay, so that'll be on each of your travel data pages to step back and come in to see the group of data you know, and again, from here, you can also enter new standard data or enter new protected data. All right, so let me stop there and see if anybody has any questions. Are we doing good online? So I have a question. What is the protected data that makes it separate from the standard data? So the protected data um, is, in essence, hiding the individual who was traveling in case they need to be masked yeah. for, for some special mission purpose. Yeah. If it's a classified trip, perhaps, you know, something like that. Was there a, a place in there for reimbursement, reimburse costs? I didn't see that. Uh, no, and let me defer to Cheryl or Christine. And was that in protected or the standard form? I think it was standard form. Standard, okay. We'll come back to the standard form. Is it um, is the fare basically the reimbursed cost, or is that because what if it's per, if you go up to purpose code and drop that down? Is there a place there for uh, personal travel? Yeah, and everything at the moment, from what I understand, was brought over from the legacy platform without new exceptions. But if that wasn't a requirement before or available before, then it wouldn't be available now. Is that something that you say that you were using and is not here? Yeah, um, in, uh, I, I think in Maybe SFTR, I'll, I'll go back and look at uh, I don't know if you do reporting for both PCTR and SFTR. In SFTR, okay. there's a, a personal option, but there isn't one in PCTR. Um, and Jarl, we just lost your screen, by the way. I uh, can't okay. see. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav.
Oh. Okay, sorry, I did see that, and I think I disconnected and reconnected, so let me... Yep, I can see Thank it. you for letting me know. A little network hiccup, is that better? Excellent. Okay, so let me cancel out of there. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and, again, pretending as this user, um, return to our sub step. But just again to review, we came to the data entry tab. I can use the reporting period icon to come to the reporting period page. When I am confident that all of my travel data has been uh, input into the system, Status. Okay, my organization data status. This is the step required for them to, for me to submit for approval. Okay, so remember those two sub steps in the data entry uh, process. Um, Carol, so the protected one that you just created, there's no differentiate differentiation on on this. It says this was protected and this was standard. There is not, um, at least on this this quick view. If we roll over, um, or we do we have to go into the actual travel data form in order to know. So there's not necessarily, and Pranav, correct, correct me if I'm missing something, but an indicator that this was protected versus standard. Okay, I have a question about the protected travel. Because if the trip is classified, we can't process that on our regular system. We can only process classified information on the PlasNet system, so. Do you have a? I could say you can't process. Do you have a better maybe definition of protected that I'm providing, so? That's what it's always been called protected. Um, classified may mean something different from agency to agency. Okay. But some agencies can submit certain information, you know, without actually input a person's name or the location at where they went. They can put the, the cost of the trip and um, the exception company. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, and just to review, um, so again, I'm pretending that I'm complete with all of my data entry. Okay. How I can get back here again, data entry tab, look for my level within commerce and uh, patent trademark. And this pie chart here is the reporting period. So my step necessary before I submit is to update my organizational status. So I want to go ahead and edit the reporting period detail. And then you can see the drop down here. I'm going to set it to complete. By default, it is incomplete. But we do also have a no data to report. Okay. So there possibly is the option is why this is here, that for this reporting period, this fiscal year, there, there might not be any data to report. Okay, so this would mean that there would be no travel data within the reporting period, so you would just double check on that. Otherwise, if you have a record, uh, it has to, you know, be complete and then submitted for approval. Okay, I see some nods here, so that sounds like that happens sometimes. So since I do have travel um, information, I'm going to update to complete. And then you can see that status has changed. And then I can submit for approval. We get a pop-up here saying that the approval, okay, just the note here is that once it's submitted for approval, no changes can be made after that. So any Jeopardy fans, you know, is this your final answer? Submit it on for approval. I'll show you that there is the ability to recall and if we do get it rejected for some reason, that's when we can edit. But once we send it forth for approval and it's approved in particular, the, the records are locked down. All right, so if I click OK there, what you're going to need to do in the approval process, okay, is choose the approver. So my understanding is that you know who will be approving the particular records for you. So the one thing to remember is for the next approver, you want to choose custom portal user. That's just kind of a default on the system that everyone is assigned to. And then you can use the uh, search icon here. 
or you can begin typing in the person's name if you don't remember it all. Again, I'm going to use a generic uh, sample name. I think it's approval. All right, let me. There we go. So just again, once you type in the individual's name and you click search, the results should show up and you can click the individual and then send the next approver. So when Cecilia asked before, we're now moving to step one to two that we reviewed earlier. This approver is going to be getting an email letting them know that they have uh, something to go ahead and come into the system and approve. How do we know who is our approver? That's uh, my understanding that people would know, but I think... Yeah, each agency designates their approver and their name and user. So, yeah. So the, the email's going to come up from, you know, um, a higher level to your agency to designate an approver and a, um, a user for the tool. That a good Yeah. <laughs> That's a key word there. <laughs> so the question was too, how do we know who our approver is? Uh, and, and Cheryl mentioned that the agency should be letting everyone know kind of the approval, um, who is approving information. Is there anybody they could reach out to in case they're not? They can reach out to me. Okay. So and reach I'm out to Cheryl in case, in case you're not sure. It'll be the same people that approve and, and enter data in the old system. But, you know, we're, we're trying to do it a little bit more um, official, so we're going to have you know, the agency to designate a user, a data entry user, uh, approver, and a user management person for me. me yeah, and it could be three, it could be three roles within one person, so. Me, me, person. me, and me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, as we were talking about earlier, you know, you could be, you could be sending it to yourself, and I should have remembered uh, to note that. In case you're the approver, the system will allow you to send it to yourself as the approver. Okay. Just want to scroll down on the. Re oh, sorry. Um, will it allow you to choose from all options? Not unless that entity exists as an account in the system, which I don't think that would be possible. Yeah, it, would be, it has to be sent to a particular individual, which is typically you know an account, but typically tied to an individual. Um, so on the reporting period page, we'll have your approval history. You can see that it is pending, as well as the approval status awaiting review. Okay. Um, if it is uh, approved, I'll show you a couple of different examples as we go forth uh, in terms of the status. If it's rejected, this will be red and rejected, or green and approved. Now, uh, in the case, again, sometimes we press a button and we don't mean to, so you have the recall option here. That's just going to go ahead and recall the request. The individual uh, who you had sent it to will receive notification. Uh, and then if you enter a comment here about why it's being recalled, okay, and just as, to be a part of the record. This will allow you, if you do recall it, it will allow you to go back and edit those individual travel data records in the case that you recalled it for a particular reason to update and then you would go through the same process as we just showed to resubmit. Okay, so I'm just going to cancel out of there. <clears throat> so that's completing the step one for PCTR, but again, just pointing out once it is submitted for approval, then that, that step is locked. So is there a point you're going to show us how, or I'm sure you are, I hope, going to show us how to do the bulk upload yes. instead of one by one? Yes. Um, yes. We will get to that too. So I just want to quickly review um, the data entry for uh, SFTR and TRIP. Again, very, almost exactly, well, I would say exactly the same processes and navigation steps, uh, just different types of data. Okay. And again, when I switch over to SFTR, so to be mindful that it is a semi-annual, we want to make sure we're choosing the right time period that we're looking to report against. So when I choose April through September, I'm able to get uh, my options here. Again, as an oversight user, I have access to a lot more than what you'll see. Typically, you'll see one line. So for today's purpose, I'll use commerce as well. <clears throat> 
and I'll come into the, the data entry tab to up upload the individual record. I'm just going to show you the form to save time, not fill it out, but you can see again different types of fields. You want to be mindful of the required red ones and also roll over anything that you're not sure of what the field requires. Okay. And I think uh, based on the question we had earlier, here's the cost information, then this might have been what you're thinking in terms of the reimbursement cost. Okay. I did neglect to point out that we're moving forward in the guide, so if uh, you're following along, we're moving on to page 29 for the SFTR process. I'm just going to cancel out of here and show you a filled out example and show you how we can move forward with submitting. You can see that I already have an example here. I can come in to edit. Well, you see I have the same button to enter new. There's only one type of SFTR data, so we only have one button. Okay, edit will take me to the edit page. And so just to show you a filled out example. And again, remember that this is sample data. If you see something not um, necessarily as real as world, real world, probably why, but did you have a, a comment or question? The SFTR shows personal, the, the PCTR didn't. Did we say it's per, per, Yeah, PCTR doesn't collect personal on the track. Right. Yep. This, this is the one I was looking for. Okay. Good. And we can review um, some of the business rules around each of these to it in the user guide has uh, a much deeper explanation of each of the types of travel. Um, just for time's sake to be more in the system, I didn't uh, review. So for instance, on page 30, you see that there's a, a detailed explanation of the SFTR um, travel requirement and some of the reminders of the business rules there. Okay, and then as I uh, proceed through the system, uh, or pr proceed through the process. Again, similar, if I'm confident that all of my data has been entered, I would then want to uh, come to the reporting period. Okay, again, the group of records, in this case I only have one. I need to update my organizational status by coming to edit. Why don't you try to submit, because you forgot to update that. Will it tell you you need to go in and update? It will. It'll give you an error message. I can show you that briefly. So yeah, in case you forget to that um, sub-step, if you try any of these submit for approvals, they're going to give you um, a similar error. It won't look like this on the real system, but typically it's a red error at the top um, that'll let you know kind of what needs to happen in order for that operation to complete. Let me come back. To commerce. Okay, so your reporting period when we're ready to update and submit. And then we submit for approval. So again, any of these buttons will do. Again, don't forget your customer portal user. Once you type something in the field, typically, again, the system starts to remember. So once you know your approver, if it's the same, you can enter that. And then you, get, you have your status. Again, a notification will be sent to this particular user. Unlike our sample system here, it will be an actual name. And then once this is approved, we'll, we'll show you that step shortly as well then you'll get a, a reminder uh, email about that it's been approved or rejected. Um, let's just say the approver is out of town. After seven days or a certain time period, do they get reminders that there's still a, doc, there's still a report awaiting their approval? Not, my, uh, not as I understand. Yeah, that's not, correct. No um, so they'll only get the email on the, first the one, one time. Is that um, correct? And they won't get it, uh, like the reminder email. Okay. 
Yeah, so just the first reminder, good question. Um, if you see that you're not getting your approval back, it may be then you have to send a separate message outside the system. And again, if uh, we'll probably have to br abbreviate the chatter overview, but as you, uh, if you, when you can use chatter, perhaps as a way as well to kind of ping somebody, say, hey, I'm waiting on this approval. Okay, y'all, get off your feet again. Oh, why don't we keep uh, logging out? Sorry about that. Seems like uh, I keep losing my sharing. Back. Okay. All right. So last, I just want to show trip. We'll abbreviate this as well. So you can see, it came to trip. Choose the fiscal year, and then enter that information. Um, if I come through the data form as well. Okay. Can you use any of these examples? And just. I wanted to abbreviate this as well because there's a lot of information to input for TRIP, but you can see actually that all of the fields are required, so you can enter records in uh, this way as well. Since this is only uh, one entry, typically, uh, there is no bulk upload process for TRIP. It's just going to be for PCTR and SFRT. But we can come and take a look at a filled out example quickly. So this will take us to a travel record, and if we needed to update, just as a reminder, we can come and edit and see some of how it's filled out. So again, in any case where it's a cost, you don't have to put the dollar sign, just enter in the, the information and whole numbers. Okay. And I would go through the same process as I did when I'm ready and all of my information is in the system come to the reporting period, would update my organizational status, and then submit that for approval. So the same, same process for TRIP information as well. Okay. All right, so we're going to switch uh, over to the bulk upload so you can see and some important reminders here because we may not be typing information to the system. In the forms, again, this is going to be available to your data entry users. If you're playing both roles, the data entry and approval, perhaps both as well. But again, bulk upload. Similar to our data entry tab, we're going to have lots of instructions here, so review that. We'll go over all of this together now. But the biggest thing to remember from a bulk upload standpoint, if you remember one thing from today, is that you need to use the templates that are provided here within the system and not your former templates or your own that you create. Okay? And the reasoning is that the formatting provided in these templates are able to be read by the system um, in the terms of how the worksheets have, have been set up in Excel. So depending on if you're going to be uploading PCR data, PCTR data, or SFTR, you can switch between the templates. Okay, and give the system a second to uh, bring that up. All right, so I'll switch again. As you can see how the name changes here. So you want to download the template first. When you do that, oh, I forgot one step, and this is uh, my, my fault. So let me do switch my role really quick, as I need to do for this particular circumstance. All right, so we want to go ahead. Download the template first. You can see it downloads here in my browser. So however, which browser you're using, most likely Chrome or IE. And I'll open that up for you so you can see. Okay, again, instructions will be on the first tab. This replicates what we saw in the system at the top. Your data entry goes onto the PCTR tab. Again, replicating what we see in the system, the red items are going to be the ones required. If you roll over, we have descriptions like we did in the system. Okay? And you don't need to fill out the error code. That will be something that um, if we do get errors in the system, would, would, would be in a file that we would download that I'll show you shortly. 
And then as we're putting in the um, exception codes, you can see these are drop downs and the purpose code. In the case that you don't remember what those are, the reference here on the third tab is available for you. Okay, but for the entry purposes, you only need the actual code itself in each, not the description as well, or else you'll get an error. Can, can you go back to the exception code real quick? Because um, we're now doing premium economy, right? Yes. You want the reference tab or the awesome. drop down? Okay. So the S is, or no, the T. I'm having difficulty getting my TMC to split out when that's being used. Yeah, we heard there was some situations going on like that. <clears throat> All right, so once then I fill out, I think I have an example to show you here. So just, you know, fill out a couple of examples. <clears throat> once I have this, I would save it. You, know, you save it with whatever name and wherever on your computer you're going to be able to find. And when we come back to the platform, that's when we'll choose the file. And I know um, I typically purposely have a couple of errors, but what will happen is the system, once you choose the file, you want to click Import Data. And then you can see the status here of uploading. Depending on how many records there are, you will it'll uh, be basically operating in the background. You could leave the tab and come back, um, or you know again you'll see here that the files and submitted results will be emailed to you. If I refresh the tab here, okay, I did actually get some errors, <clears throat> and the error .csv file is what you're going to be able to use to be able to tell what exactly went wrong, okay? If you do end up putting in a file, perhaps you did something to the file and it, it, um, you get an Excel file incompatible, just go ahead and download the template. But that's what's going to happen if you also try to use something of your own. If I quickly click, click on the error file here, and the error code column, you'll see the, the system's going to go ahead and tell you what it found in the file and what you need to fix. Okay, so use that CSV file uh, as well. There'll be an email again, as the system mentioned, to you, let you know that the file either was entered correctly or it encountered errors and it needs to be fixed. So once they are fixed, they need to do happen offline, and you would come back uh, and then re-upload. Can so you go back one second? That number you had on the left, I'm trying to see if that's the same numbers up there. Go back to where you just. The screen you were just on? Uh, my error one? Yeah, so the first number. Yeah, is that, yeah. Uh, that's a good good point. So what I didn't um, point out, and thank you for that, when you are completing the report, when you're completing a bulk upload, so this is going to be the ID that we saw in the system the reporting period ID. So this is something that you will need to grab from the system and copy into the Excel file. And again, so that will be, for instance, I'll come back and show you quickly. Perhaps where, you know, if I come back to the data entry tab, just using TCTR as my example, if I come back to commerce, if I'm the one, um, as before, going ahead and um, I want to go ahead and report data against this reporting period, I can come into that reporting period and this is the ID that I'm going to be using. So each of, these, each of those rows in Excel is then going to become one of these travel data records within this reporting period in the system. So would those numbers be different or is it one number for fiscal 17? It would be the reporting period, again, it would be associated with your particular level, so your agency, sub-agency, or bureau, and that and per fiscal year. So, yeah, it, it, if you're not, yeah, I think in mine I had multiple. Um, to show you, you could go against different reporting periods, but if you're just responsible for one particular area, that, that reporting period would be the same. But for, like, Department of State, 
<clears throat> hierarchy three may have a different number, but um, even though it's the same fiscal year, two may have a different number. Um, for PCTR, there would be one number for the whole fiscal um, the reporting of the fiscal year 2017. No matter what the level is. Uh, it was, again, it's independent per fiscal year and then per level. So if I like, if we use Department of State as an example, so, um, you know, each level here then has a unique reporting period so, that it would use. So if you're reporting against multiple levels, you would need to obtain that unique reporting period ID. And that's going to tell the system, I want this to be associated with Mission Albania or Mission Angola, that RP number. Now, and again, this is the number that the system is generating, right. not me. Exactly. So I will have two numbers. If, you're, if you are creating your own unique ID, then that, that's what the Traven Travel eight. Agency ID. Does it, does it say how many levels eight has, USC? And I believe this is what happened. This is what we'll see in the real system. Um, Agency for International yeah. Development. I'm not sure if this is correct, if it's just one, because I don't see the house icon, but I can ask and see if Pranav could look at the, the data the level there. So if I do the bulk overload, I have to go back and find one of the records and take that number and Apply. Yeah, in the, in the, if you, in the Excel file, it has to have the associated reporting period ID, so the system knows to which one of those levels in fiscal years do I want to associate this information. And again, if, if it is just for one level, then it would all be the same. And you can just you know, copy and paste it all the way down the left. Be careful of dragging, right? And depending on the Excel we're using, sometimes it increments. So just, you know, you, you can usually choose uh, an entire area, you know, in order to, to copy something into, Oops. if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, so that's an important component. Otherwise, you'll definitely get errors that that is a missing piece of your file because the system's not going to know where to put the information. All right, we're running a little longer than I thought, but definitely good questions. Um, I want to see if there's any other questions about the bulk upload process before I show how we get through the approval steps. All right. So let's come over to approvals. This will be our approval users only. As a quick reminder as well, on your travel home tab, most of you will not see the home uh, tab here just because I switched uh, the role. You also, for those who have approval status, will have items to approve. It's two, two different entry points to the same page. All right, and we can see here then on the approval status that we have uh, reassign. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this is if we feel for some reason that we've been assigned this reporting period. Uh, by mistake. How I look into that is coming into the reporting period ID. And as you can see, I have the associated travel data, so there's all of the records that have been entered. And as a reviewer, I'd want to go into that record to see and make sure that all that information is correct. You may not have the edit button, but if you're playing both roles, that's when you would see that as well. And we, want to, we, we would want to review each of those uh, travel data records associated with the reporting period. can use that link to hop back. And since we're in here, as we've reviewed them all, I can come in then to approve or reject. For reviewing, if I've got 500 records, do I have to go into each one individually, or can I get a view that I just scroll down? For now, it would be individually. Um, I think at a later point, we can talk about uh, that's where reporting would come into play. If there was a separate report, perhaps, that you could create to pull in your records and have an easier way to look at them all in a table kind of format. Or even if it could come up and go from, like you do in time, to one record to the next record. Yeah, next, 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 right. next. Yeah, good point. OK. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to say for both approval and reject. Approval may not be necessary, but best practice usually is we enter some comments. Um, and then we would just go ahead and click approve. So you can see our status changes. Again, the individual who submitted this record to us uh, would go ahead and get a notification as well. And this is where we're going to see uh, the, that the, the status icon change to green on the data entry page as well. Okay. Just to show you the difference there too, come back into this particular entry. Here's where you can see a little bit more of the history that I've set up. The individual did recall it. You know, it's an option that I showed you earlier, and now it's back and pending since it's been resubmitted. I could reassign if I'd like, but I'm going to go ahead and approve or reject this one because it's still not correct. Definitely putting in a comment about why I think it's not correct. Okay, and then send that back. So the individual is going to go ahead and get an item sent to them that the item that the reporting period was rejected. Okay. And if we go to the data entry tab, we'll then be able to see similar to that red icon we saw earlier. So like if I go into this reporting period we didn't earlier, but you can see that it's red because this has been rejected. Okay, and then we can see who's involved in that process. All right, so the last step then um, to close out this process is going to be coming back to the data entry tab. And again, as, as a level one approver user, we're going to want to come to the house icon. I believe I set myself up from the Department of Justice standpoint. Okay, so I can look as a Department of Justice level one user. I see that all of my sub-agencies, I don't have any bureau levels here, are green. Okay, so that means, again, they've gone through this entry and submission approval process. I now can come into the house icon, and this is going to head and let me, as a level one approver, all I need to do is come in and update the agency data status, similar to the organization status. I have incomplete, complete, and no data to report. So if it's the case that I have no data and absolutely no records, then I would choose that option. But for today, since I know I do, I'll click complete, and then we have save. So what does it mean if it didn't have a house? I would say uh, this is more the sample system. Every top level one agency will have a house icon associated with it. So in the system that, there's, you know, if it doesn't have a house, typically it's a sub-level agency or a bureau, but each top level agency should have an icon, but as a test system it just might not be the case. So each each level one agency should have a house icon associated with it. Okay, I didn't see a house on mine, that's why. Yeah, and I, get, I apologize, it may not be exactly as it appears in the real production system. Okay, but it'll, I'll see a house come. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you should, yes. As long as you're the level one user. Yeah. And you can see that the house icon turned green. So this then tells Cheryl that you know, this particular agency is complete with the process. Okay. And hopefully well before the reporting period ends. So now what will we see if, if Cheryl comes back and says something's wrong, we'll see that red? Yeah, or, or Cheryl isn't necessarily going to be um, approving or disproving information. Um, she may have on her own accord, at, uh, but for the, for the house icon and for the, for the level is complete, there was no approval process. As you saw, it was just I'm considered my agency as complete. But she can say or see that this Department of Education has a level or two that may be in rejected status. You cannot, the level one agency person cannot change the agency status to complete if they have rejected data. So there, you'll get a, a, a notification in, or an error in the system that there's still information that's not yet approved. 
So this actually happened between me and Cheryl last year. I had um, some records duplicated because uh -huh. I had uploaded. Um, I tried to be proactive and upload it via quarters, and then I had the corrected ones that ended up being uploaded as a duplicate. So with them, with, in that particular instance where you have duplicate entries, would that cause a reject? I believe it will, Ms. Sue. We won't know exactly until we get into it, but I believe it will. Um, for the approver role, is it required that the approver have to look at every document or can they just get notification that it's ready for review and they just say, okay, I think it's right and just stamp it approved? I think, um, and let me see if this is, let yeah, me go back to, I'll use the data entry for something inside it. I think if I look at, this one in here. I thought I thought that if I rolled over this, it might give me a quick view. Um, but what your question was, just so I understood. So you know, so they, they turn around and say, "Oh well, I don't know what that is, but I don't have time today. Can I just stamp it, submit for approval, or change it to an approved status as an approver?" So yeah, the data is entried. They want it to go to another level for a review before it goes to GSA. Yeah, so and what I didn't show you, just uh, stepping through the process, if you, um, in the approvals screen, I don't have any left here, but you will have the ability, your records will display here, you'll have the ability to have like a checkbox. So you could do approvals in bulk. Um, you know, if you've looked at it and perhaps leave it for later, you can go ahead and do it all at one time. I don't want to look at it and just bulk approve. Yeah. You can prove it in bulk. Yeah. So you'll have a checkbox. You know, I, I stepped into the reporting period and then stepped into the data records. There'll be a checkbox on the left here that you can check and then an option you can see up here, do approve, reject. So that's how you can do reporting periods in bulk if you're, you know, depending on the amount that you have to review. Good question. All right, so doing a little bit of time check, I know we have a couple uh, more minutes. I at least want to go through reporting. Are we okay? I guess we're going to probably, I want to at least show the canned reports. Um, probably have to not cover chatter today. I should have a better pacing next time, but, or do you want to um, see if people can run over? Let's do reports now and see, um, and see if we can cover chatter and um, stay for more okay. Yeah, it shouldn't take too long. Okay. Let's worry about questions too, as long as we're doing okay yeah, with those report. online. Yep. Perhaps okay. we'll be responding. Awesome. All right. So reports again. So what we tried to do, um, and again, you, you'll see a lot more information here than you may typically have access to. But as you get on the reports tab, uh, there's a couple of areas here on the left. These are more considered folders. You can see uh, labeled here. As we get to more complex training in the reports area, you'll be able to, we'll teach you how to create your new, uh, own reports. Uh, but what I want to point your attention to are these travel, PCTR, SFTR, and trip report folders. So as I click on each, again, each of you may have access to one or more, depending on which you report against. Okay, so these will then bring you to links of some canned reports. Again, these were brought over from the legacy platform. Uh, queries, I think, as some uh, folks have previously called it, in order to pull information um, for you. You'll only have access to the information available to you based on your level. So as we talked about earlier, if you're level one, you'll be able to see everything from your level down. If you're level three, you're only going to be able to see your bureau's information. Is there going to be a report that compares <clears throat> you against other agencies? Oh, I don't think so, but that may be something like, um, you, you know, because MCC is always wanting to know how, how they fit into how they fit in with state and aid. Yeah. So yeah. I'm currently not. So yes, we're going to do that. That's, mm -hmm. that's not. Um, that's more of a static report because you, the way the permission okay. are set, you can only they filter it, so you can only see yours. But yeah, we were going to do that after the. We get all the data from the yeah. year. Yeah. Perfect. So it'll be at an, um, well, trip is already rolled up. It's, you know, it's rolled up, so there's no sensitive information there. Okay. Yep. 
All right, just be mindful, um, again, so you can see the, the, there's a lot more information in the user guide as I'm stepping through reports today pretty quickly. Um, starting on page 65, you'll be able to go back and take a look at some of this uh, subsequently to get familiar. But just want to point out to you the path, to, you know, sort of come to reports based on the area that you're working with, and then, you know, you want to go ahead and choose the report that you would like to see. Right. I kind of feel like, so uh, in Salesforce, contrary to what was in the legacy system, the report functionality is definitely very robust. I feel like it's a session on its own. Yeah. Um, since we are rolling out a new system and it's a whole lot coming at you, I want to, I want to focus on data entry at first. Right. You know, since that, you know, since um, we want to really take those timelines and then I feel like we have some more time reports because you know you'll be doing that after you get your data all together. I want to spend the next, you know, the next time that we have together. I mean, you're probably going to be spending time aggregating all the data that you have and then worrying about data entry. And we'll have some subsequent meetings focused just on reports. Okay, by the time you're more comfortable with the system, and you know, we'll be able to um, produce more valuable reports at that time. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sure. So, just want to show you um, again if. Uh, Using the reports, if you come into the report itself, just take a look at a trip uh, purpose duration. As you come into the report uh, that gets generated, uh, again, I'm going to really kind of skip through some of this. There'll be some information in the user guide, but in order to um, take this information offline, there's a couple of options for you, and I definitely would recommend using the printable view. And what that means is that this will go ahead and download an Excel file for you and will go ahead and let you know what filters have been applied in order to create this report. Uh, and it will also give you the data formatted in this, in this manner. Okay, the export is going to be a little bit more of a raw data dump. It will still have the data that appears here and have the filters applied, but it will be more just columns and rows of data versus what I'll show you now when I take down the printable view. So you can see it downloaded a, an Excel file for me. And of course, it makes it um, – sorry, I had my other one highlighted, so let me go open that again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not reading too fast. All right. So you can see then how it comes down in Excel pretty much like it was seen in the screen. And then, you know, if we wanted to actually print this out, we could. So it, it kind of keeps the, the formatting based on the report. And all of the reports, you know, we tried to keep as close to, if not exact, to what was in the previous system. As you guys are working with this and have ideas like, like you just brought up, Jeanette, um, you know, that's what we kind of the information we'll be looking for when we develop some of the, the training to talk more about the customization in particular from the deeper level report training. But just wanted to g g kind of give you a lay of the land in terms of what was available and the information. So take a look at, don't have time to go through each of these, but take a look at the descriptions of what you have access to. And as you have ideas, Cheryl, can I let them know to contact you, and then we can use that information to develop the subsequent training. All right, then lastly, uh, we have Chatter, okay, which I mentioned is a, is a collaboration tool. So each of you will have access to this. It's uh, not something that is restricted, per se, by any of the user roles. It's a system-wide feature. You probably have seen this particular area on a, in a couple of different places that I've been in the system. So if anybody have, has used a uh, social media service, for instance, I'll use Facebook as an example, this is quite similar in terms of that mode of communication, although this is restricted to this particular application. Okay, so the only thing that is happening, you know, I'll show you quickly how to set up your email settings, but in essence, you know, to bring some of our training uh, together. I can do and look for people, so no spaces. Once you get to know who else is on the platform and who you might be working with, I want to remind Christine, or that example Jeanette you raised earlier, um, 
if somebody has not been approving something in a timely manner, we can ping them on Chatter. And this goes ahead and we'll, we'll let Christine know. It'll also send her an email based on her email settings, but we'll let her know in the system um, that somebody is trying to communicate with her. Okay. And then share would be basically posting that information. Now these posts, you can see I have a couple available based on some other trainings that we've done, are, are collected in the menu we see here on the left. All right, so this feed is sort of a top level uh, menu item of how these posts are collected. So what I follow, and you'll see that anything that I've posted or that people have named me, and I have follow buttons that I can go ahead and choose. If I want to follow other people like my approver, you know, I can, so we can communicate easily, that's something that could happen. I can filter it by just who's communicated to me, or if I've actually gone ahead, next to message, you'll see an option to um, bookmark. I've already done this bookmark, but this will remove uh, that bookmark, but I've put this in here just for the purpose of seeing this message. Okay, and if we don't want to hear particular um, on streams, we can go ahead and mute. And then all company is really more oral organization. So this will really be everything without any filters. All right, and then just moving on down um, from a chatter perspective, the people is another sort of menu item that you can see who, uh, who we recently viewed or all people, depending. I know this will definitely be limited information. But one important area I want to highlight is the groups. <clears throat> and I know when training we talked with, with Cheryl about you know if, if the need perhaps arises that uh, PCTR might benefit from having its own group where all the communications happen within that environment, then we can go ahead and work with support to get that group set up or something for TRIP or something for SFTR. Okay, so you'll be uh, we'll definitely communicate out if that occurs, um, but that's where you would come to look for and be able to easily find messages that are being organized by group. Uh, and, and messages can also be organized by topics, and this is, could be something that uh, Cheryl or you know support helps to set up as well as, as we find hot topics that we might generate and tag information with. And I want to point your attention to that we can also upload files. So I'll go back to the post to show you where that is. Um, within the uh, user guide, there is a section on chatter you know, with more time that you can review uh, starting on page 74. Um, there is a permissions table, I believe, from a file perspective on page 80. Okay, the files, I'll come back to the feed area, is something that when you post, you can go ahead and restrict the sharing of. Okay, so if I want to upload perhaps, um, let's take that error file. I, Well, let's take one of my picture slides because I think we're limited to file types. <clears throat> and depending on the size of the file, oh, okay. So PDF and Word documents only, my apologies. Uh, I didn't have one prepared. But once that's in place, you can then go ahead and use your restrictions that you see in the user guide to restrict that to certain individuals. Or like I did earlier with Christine, use your at symbol to call out particular um, individuals, like for instance, if I wanted to share something with Pranav. Okay. So just a, a quick overview. I know some of you who might be using Salesforce in other capacities could be familiar. Um, the one last thing I want to show you, because you'll get pinged if people are sending messages to you, and as these threads, for instance, if I comment on uh, this particular thread, And this, continue, this conversation continues to go, you know, I would get emailed on that. So you do have some options from an email setting and account standpoint. If you come up to your user where I showed you earlier to log out in your My Settings, okay, you have your chatter email notification. So if you don't want to be overwhelmed by email, you can take a look at, you know, for instance, if people start to follow you, if you're a lead, uh, people might want to follow you and see what's going on with your activity um, or be pinged about what you've been posting. But 
If you don't necessarily want to have an email every time someone follows you, you just uncheck that. Okay? Or if people respond to your posts or profile, you can take a look at uh, each of these options and see and, you know, and limit the amount of email that you're getting as well as uh, perhaps even do a, a, day, a weekly digest versus daily digest if it's not as important to get notified each day. Okay? And then you would save that. This is also where, and again in our, in our settings, where I mentioned earlier where you could change your password on your own. Okay? So that's something that you have available to you from within the system if you want to maintain your own security uh, and change that upon your own frequency if you'd like. All right, I'm going to stop there. Just make sure that everyone is aware of the support information and make sure that we uh, go ahead and provide a bit more time for questions if people can hang on. Let me come back to the presentation. As we noted earlier, uh, the support information has been separated out per application or per reporting group. Okay, so be mindful if you are reporting on multiple uh, ones that, you know, email the particular help desk that you need to, uh, to, to contact. And, and in essence, it'll be the same help desk individuals, but this helps them to better um, have information readily available to respond based on the issue that might have been, uh, that it might have occurred. Okay. So you can go ahead and email them, as well as we talked about earlier, you can email them about new users. And Cheryl was out of the room at that point, but again, that's going to be an approval process that she will work through um, to be able to work with you all and the, the agency leads to get those, those users approved. So please email the technical support team to get those users in the system. And, and again, any issues that you might have encountered, um, as well as they're, they're happy to help entertain questions. Definitely feel free to leverage you know, the, the user guide and the presentation and the recording once we publish it from today um, in case it's just a usability question, but um, they're definitely there to help you particularly get out of a, a sticky situation or any of issues that you might find. So the, uh, the resources that we have available, again, the user guide that we've been reviewing and the training presentation also can leverage support Again, we'll publish the recording of today's training in about two weeks' time once that uh, production process completes. And we will be hosting a second training session similar to this one on October 17th. We had a limited time frame today to try to squeeze stuff into two hours. Seems like three hours next time might work a little bit better. Um, but I'll definitely be here and hang on if anybody has any additional questions. Um, I see that Pranav has been doing very good online. but. If you guys too here in the room have additional questions or want to review something further, definitely happy to, to hang out with you. How long do you think before the recorded training will be um, posted on GSA's website? It's, uh, it's usually about two weeks because we have to go through a production process to get the script along with the audio um, for the hearing impaired. But, we um, plan to post it in the application. Yeah. Oh, in the in the um. So where I mentioned earlier on the home tab, the travel okay. home, uh, in the training area. Okay. We'll communicate that. Okay. Sorry. But about two weeks time. Okay. That's typically what it takes. You do need to scoot and you're in the room. Um, I see some of you filling that out already. We just have a brief evaluation. Happy to have you complete those, if you would, to let us know how things went uh, from your perspective and how they improved. Otherwise, again, we'll hang out. I'll probably stop the recording in case there is, unless there are no more questions. But definitely happy to remain on the line. Any other questions come through? Mine's not loading for some reason.